On the next Inside California Education. The death of a language it goes hand in hand with the death of a culture and that should be stopped as much as possible. The language spoken by the Yurok tribe in Northern California is being saved from the brink of extinction and it's being done with the help of local public school students. Explore a new push to enroll foster youth in college, an effort that supporters say is necessary for them to live above the poverty line in expensive areas of California like the Silicon Valley. All right, you ready for the dance audition? And a long-running performing arts program in Modesto casts students from several different schools and grades, uniting them all through the experience of theater. It's all next on Inside California Education. Funding for Inside California Education is made possible by... Since 1985, the California Lottery has raised more than $32 billion in supplemental funding for California's 1,100 public school districts from kindergarten through college. That's approximately $191 for each full-time student based on $1.5 billion contributed in fiscal year 2016-17. With caring teachers, committed administrators, and active parents, every public school student can realize their dreams. The California Lottery, imagine the possibilities. The Stewart Foundation, improving life outcomes for young people through education. Welcome to Inside California Education. I'm Jim Finnerty. In far northern California near Eureka, you'll discover rugged beaches and rivers that have been the home to the Yurok tribe for centuries. That's where we found tribal members who are partnering with schools there to keep a key part of their culture alive, the Yurok language. You're gonna copycat me three times, we're gonna do this three times, okay? So, may we more? May we more. May we more? May we more. May we more. All right, school yeah, school yeah. Are you queen neck now, James Jensa, Kicha Ha Kumika, Pulik La Wata, Eureka High School, Chi Wave Tech, Pop Sal Essi Chiguri, Chiguri Ukumoi Pong. James Jinsaw is teaching these students an ancient Native American language. It's also his tribe's native language. All the words in Yurok, I think they're so beautiful. Yurok is one of three world languages offered to students at Eureka High School in Humboldt County. It's one of several public schools teaching Yurok in the far northern region of California. Not Perry, but Perry. There's a lot of kids that take Yurok that take it because just because they're curious and they want to find out what it's all about. Wait, Yun. If I can learn Spanish or German anywhere else, this is the only place I can actually learn Yurok. I took it just out of interest in linguistics and I really do like how it sounds. It sounds aesthetically nice to me. Other students are learning Yurok for deeper reasons than fulfilling their foreign language requirement. Who's on Nina Pump? Probably a quarter of the students are actually have Yurok descendancy. So I think it just, you know, part of that trying to find out who they are and, and find out a little bit more about themselves. Uh, Kinnick, Danny is one of those students who is taking the advanced Yurok language class. Mr. Jensa not only teaches the language, but he also teaches the cultures and the stories that come with it. And he has done so much to help this language. When I started learning this language, there was, all my speakers were all in their 90s, I had a couple that were close to 100 years old. There's only 25 fluent speakers in Yurok. The language needs all the help it can get. It is on the brink of becoming extinct. Linguists 25 years ago predicted that the Yurok language was gonna be extinct by the year 2010. The last known fully fluent native speaker passed away in 2013. All that remains today are roughly 30 conversationally fluent speakers and only several people who can speak Yurok at a high fluency level with James being one of them. I think when, when any endangered language um, becomes extinct or loses its last um, speaker, 
I think that we as humans lose a part of our own humanity. For thousands of years, the Yurok, whose name means downriver people, thrived in dozens of villages along the Klamath River. It was their lifeline, used for transportation and providing a rich bounty of salmon and other essentials. But the arrival of white settlers and their diseases during the gold rush started the Yurok's decline. Thousands died and others were sent to boarding schools established by the U.S. government to eradicate the Yurok culture. Children were punished for speaking their native language and forced to learn English. By the early 1900s, only a few Yurok still spoke in their native tongue. It was like an apocalypse. I mean, our whole world changed. It's a lot of deep wounds and it's gonna take time. It's not something that can be fixed in one generation or two generations. I think that all of us are working towards that healing. And um, I think the language plays an important role in that healing process. Now, the public school system is trying to help make up for wrongs committed in the past. I think it's a little ironic that part of the reason that the, the Yurok language um, almost became extinct was because of the boarding schools and a, and a school system. But we can use that system and uh, we can use it as a tool to revitalize our language and kind of breathe life back into the language. The public schools are an integral part of the tribe's language restoration program. The long-term goal is for our people to once again be speaking only Yurok as our primary language. Barbara McKillen is with the Yurok Language Restoration Program, established by tribal elders in the 1950s. We owe a lot to those elders that had enough foresight to know that we needed to preserve our language. Like James, she too teaches Yurok. She remembers one student in particular in one of her community language classes she was teaching back in the early 2000s. He really applied himself, and I hadn't seen anybody like that. He had flashcards, he would write everything down, he'd go home and practice, he'd come back the next week, you know, ready to learn more and use what he learned. The student was James Jensaw. You know, it's always a goal of a teacher to have students learn more than, than, than you're able to teach them, and he did that. Manetchos, Tignamaki. To me, I took on that responsibility, and I don't think of it as a burden. I think of it's somebody has to do it, and I think it was just something that I was chosen to do. Kusanake, I want water. Sustaining and sharing this essential part of an ancient culture with future generations is exactly what Barbara, James, and their students hope is already starting to happen. I'm taking this class because I am Yurok, and my ultimate goal is to keep the language going, to learn it completely so that I can pass it on to younger people too. It is part of my culture, and if I can do anything to help it, I definitely will. The death of a language it goes hand in hand with the death of a culture, and that should be stopped as much as possible. Each year, the number of Yurok speakers grows, and this language restoration program is widely recognized as one of California's most successful. One day that Yurok language will be a living, flourishing language where it's spoken everywhere. I know for sure it's gonna happen. It may not happen in my lifetime, but our language will be back, our ceremonies will be back, and, and once again, we're, we're gonna be whole. Tewa Meshkot, Keet Nasa Agachintma, Aya. Walk slow, walk slow, walk slow. All those elders, they're up there uh, uh, Kuwait and they're looking down and I think they're really happy. Prior 
to the arrival of Columbus, about 300 indigenous languages were spoken in North America. Today, only half of those languages still exist. Some languages like Navajo in the Southwest and Dakota in the Midwest are thriving with tens of thousands of speakers, but many others are facing extinction, with scholars predicting that only 20 indigenous languages will remain by 2050. Our next story explores the unique challenges faced by California's foster youth, many of whom are moved from home to home and as a result from school to school. A new effort is underway to help more of these foster youth not only graduate from high school, but to move on to college and professional careers. The foster care system can be really, really messed up. Um, through the foster care system, I experienced just about every kind of abuse. I've had to endure different kinds of punishments. It was really rough. Going to school, getting picked up by someone that doesn't look like me, and then all everyone's asking me, who's that? And not knowing how to answer that. Marshall was just four years old when the police arrived at his home and arrested his parents. That moment began his entry into the foster care system, a journey that would place him in dozens of foster homes, sometimes moving every two weeks until the age of 15. From there, it was like, okay, this kid's not gonna make it in the foster home. So from that point on, I was in group homes until I was 18. That's where, for me, where my drug addiction started or my alcoholism really kicked off. Drugs and alcohol led to stints in jail, followed by periods when Marshall slept in his car. But today, Marshall is doing what would have seemed impossible a decade ago. He's four years sober and a thriving college student at California State University, Monterey Bay. He credits the Bill Wilson Center in Santa Clara for helping him rise above his past. He regularly meets with one of the center's case managers, Rebecca Trejo, for guidance and support. He's grown so much just to see him from where he came in, you know, struggling day to day and the most basic things and seeing him so successful now, you know, being in his own apartment. It's just amazing. It amazes me. The Bill Wilson Center and other foster care providers like it are placing more young people into college than ever before. It's part of a broader statewide effort that began in 2012. That's the year California enacted a new law extending foster care services from 18 until the age of 21. What it's meant for California is now we have uh, almost 9,000 18 to 21 year olds in foster care in California. And we, for the first time, have the opportunity to really help them make a safe, supported transition into post-secondary education. Fifteen years ago, working with kids leaving the foster care system at age 18, we used to focus on just getting them through high school or with a GED. Well, that started changing about 10 years ago where we said in Silicon Valley, you need to have a college education. So our focus became, let's get kids into college, let's get youth in foster care to graduate from college, because that's what you need in this valley to get a good job, a paying job where you can be successful. <coughs> yeah, she is good at a lot of things. <coughs> She even has the same name as you. Diana hopes that college will provide a fresh path for her and her young daughter. Diana was in the foster care system from the age of nine until she aged out at 21. I remember having to move around a lot and really that affected my studies because I was always having to continuously adjust to different schools and different classes and that's why I always felt like I was behind. Diana dropped out of high school when she was 17 years old. She earned her GED a year later, but she knew she, she wanted more for her growing okay. family. She joined the Bill Wilson Center's Transitional Housing Program, which provides a range of services for foster youth through the age of 25, helping with everything from rent to food and transportation. Ashley Rarick is the supervisor of the program, as well as Diana's case manager. For a lot of foster youth, they've been to 20 or more schools and been interrupted multiple times in one academic year. So you can imagine constantly having to move and 
get used to a new teacher, a new structure, what you were working on in the last class is no longer being worked on in the new class. So we start out by ensuring do they have a high school diploma. If not, we'll work with them on a plan to get there and then next on to post-secondary education. The case manager is there every step of the way helping that young person complete each and every step. They were always checking in on me to make sure that I was meeting upcoming deadlines so that I could stay on track with school. When I was in high school, I felt like I wasn't prepared and I didn't get the help that I needed. In contrast to that, when I started at Evergreen Valley College, um, Bill Wilson Center, they made sure that I was prepared to go to school. Today, Diana is in her final semester at Evergreen Valley College in San Jose. She's earning two associate's degrees. Next, she's transferring to a four-year university. This is really about helping young people, you know, get that academic credential, um, earn a place in, in the living wage economy, um, and have the opportunities for themselves and their family to, to live with security and to live with dignity. In this area, particularly in Santa Clara County, you cannot afford to live a decent life, a stable life, where you're not at risk of homelessness without a college degree or a vocational certificate beyond high school. This is the climate that we're in. Although more foster youth are enrolling in college now, challenges remain. Many don't understand the financial aid resources available to them. So even though all foster youth are eligible for the Pell Grant, only 50% of them are receiving it. Even fewer are getting the Cal Grant, and many don't realize they can get help with career technical education. That's a very common misconception. If a young person wants to go into a shorter term training program, they think, well, I don't have to do the FAFSA uh, because I'm gonna be in the automotive uh, program at a local community college that is also eligible. Those funds can also be used to offset the real costs that go with those kind of programs. Diana says she wants other foster kids to know that there are resources available to them, financial or otherwise. If they do choose to go to college, know that they're going to be well supported and that many opportunities are going to be heading their way, but most importantly that they aren't in it alone. For Marshall, he says he still deals with the trauma he went through as a child, memories that will never completely disappear. It's hard to overcome that, you know, and, and that really prohibits us from being successful. But today, he is successful. He's on the path to graduate with a bachelor's degree in collaborative health and community services with an emphasis in social work. Today, my goal is to be a social worker and to uh, affect positive change, you know, and um, it's beautiful. And this journey is, is hard, but it's, it's doable and it's worth it. Did you know foster youth get priority registration at California community colleges and California State University campuses under current state law? Foster youth are also given priority for on-campus housing at CSU campuses. During academic breaks, foster youth are allowed to stay in their housing at no additional cost. Finally, let's explore a popular performing arts program in Modesto that's been bringing together students from various schools for decades. It's called the Yes Company, and it helps students discover valuable life skills through the power of performance. This looks as professional as a Broadway tour of Mary Poppins playing in front of a packed audience at the Gallo Center for the Arts in Modesto. But these aren't professionals. They're school children from all across Stanislaw County coming together in harmony and providing some powerful lessons. The arts are amazing because there's so many things that a young person can learn. They learn about being responsible, about teamwork, about working together, problem solving, leadership, and it's all through the performing arts. Melanie Wyatt is the founder and director of Yes Company. It began in 1992 as a program for at-risk kids during the summer, but it quickly blossomed into a beloved countywide program encompassing students of all socioeconomic backgrounds. From elementary through high school, students participate in Yes Company theater performances backed by the Stanislaw County Office of Education. 
it's so important to keep the arts in the schools and in education because sometimes that's the only place a young person will shine and they find a place for themselves in, in the educational system. And unfortunately, funding is cut and cut and cut. And my premise is the arts survive when a civilization dies. Yes, Company really is special. Um, they're one of our resident companies and they're the only one that is geared entirely to youth. I bring in acts from all over the country, all over the world, really. You will never be disappointed in the quality of a Yes Company show. It is spectacular, really and truly. It's just the costuming, the choreography, the sets. It's, it's like a touring Broadway show, really and truly. They are, they are very, very good at what they do. Melanie spends the year auditioning, selecting, and rehearsing with students. This group is practicing for the summer performance of Beauty and the Beast. Melanie herself once had her eye on the stage, moving to Manhattan and landing a major modeling contract, becoming the first international plus-size model while auditioning for Broadway shows. But a back injury forced her to put her acting dreams on hold. I came home for one week vacation to Modesto, my, where I was born and raised, and uh, I never made it back to New York City. And I took that as you know, your back is your support system, and maybe it was just a little too hard. I wasn't being really supported. Former County Superintendent Martin Peterson heard a star student was back in town and asked her to come up with an idea on how to bring performing arts to students in Stanislaw County. I wanted to start with a positive acronym, so that's why it is called YES Company, Youth Entertainment Stage Company, because in acting and everything, you need to say yes. You need to say yes, and amazing things come to you through that. Several of her students perform in Broadway touring shows now. She's got opera stars and Broadway stars and all sorts of amazing you know, talent out there that Melanie cultivated with this Yes Company program. Talent like Aaron Raby, who says the Yes Company opened the door to his future in more ways than one. Melanie has been not only a role model, but uh, a caring adult and a mother to everyone who's come through the program. Um, my parents divorced uh, at a very young age and to be able to go through the program and have an adult care for you genuinely. She definitely filled an emotional void in, in my life that as you know when you're in your formative years that you know you need and sets the foundation for relationships that you have later. Erin was in Yes Company in high school, on stage playing the lead role in West Side Story, off stage finding the love of his life, Natalie, who sang in the musical Grease. He credits the Yes Company for their fifth grade daughter's confidence inside and outside the classroom. Her uh, public speaking ability and you know the way she can come across and even her ability to make friends and put herself out there, um, there's all correlations to what she's learning here. After 27 years, Yes Company is changing. We gratefully have been supported through the Stanislaus County Office of Education. But times change. Funding sources change. Priorities change of what's important or what needs focus. The program has grown so that I've been told it's pretty much unsustainable right now. And I understand that. The County Office of Education says Yes Company will continue in some capacity. In the meantime, Melanie plans to retire, but hopes to continue working with students in the performing arts, because she still draws inspiration from students like David. I've been at Yes Company for about a decade now. I wouldn't say it's enriched me so much as I would say that it's made me. Yes Company has been an absolutely defining part of my life. I, I don't know who I would be if I wasn't part of Yes Company. I have high expectations because they always rise to those expectations. A lot of times people uh, second guess children and look down on them and um, they're absolutely amazing. They're amazing what they can uh, achieve. Yes! <laughs> And that's it for this edition of Inside California Education. 
Now, if you'd like more information about the program, it's easy. Just log on to our website at insidecaled.org. We have videos from all of our shows, and you can connect with us on social media as well. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Inside California Education. May we more? May we more. Moo we more. <laughs> all right. School yet. School yet. Funding for Inside California Education is made possible by... Since 1985, the California Lottery has raised more than $32 billion in supplemental funding for California's 1,100 public school districts from kindergarten through college. That's approximately $191 for each full-time student based on $1.5 billion contributed in fiscal year 2016-17 with caring teachers, committed administrators, and active parents, every public school student can realize their dreams. The California Lottery, imagine the possibilities. So, Greg, it's a lot to take in. And I know that's hard to hear, but the doctors caught it early. Hi, Blake. My dad has cancer. And I know how hard that is to hear, but you're in the right place. And Dr. Pascal and her team they know what to do. They know what to do. The doctors know what to do. So here's the plan. First off, we're going to give you all this The Stewart Foundation, improving life outcomes for young people through education. Additional funding for Inside California Education is made possible by these organizations supporting public education.